You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor. This is the Play Therapy Podcast where you get a master class in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. In today's episode, I am answering a question from a listener, Summer, in Illinois. And her question is about board games in the playroom. Really a fun topic because we almost always have board games in a child-centered playroom, but there's a lot of confusion over how to handle that. And is it truly non-directive? And can you have one in a child-centered playroom? And how do you handle game play with kids? What do you do under certain circumstances, et cetera, et cetera? So we're going to dive into Summer's question together. Summer, thank you for emailing and thanks for listening in Illinois. I was just in Chicago last year for the Rays... Cubs series, as well as the Rays White Sox series. So the Rays played both Chicago teams back to back. So we went up and we got to go to Wrigley and we got to go to the White Sox stadium and crazy. I couldn't have orchestrated this story if I wanted to. It was mid to late April and we were sitting in Wrigley stadium. And for those of you non-baseball people, Wrigley is the stadium. It's the one with the history and the the wonder and the awe. And you walk in there and you feel like you're on hallowed ground. I mean, the, the feet in cleats that have walked in Wrigley, it is just crazy. The history and, oh my word, all of it. The ivy wall, blah, blah, blah. I could go on. But I'm telling you, the craziness of this is us little Florida people are up in Chicago, mid to late April, sitting in Wrigley, and it starts snowing. So I just want to let you all know, I I did not expect to have snow watching a game at Wrigley of all places, but I will never, ever forget that experience. What a cool memory and just a fun, fun trip. So I was recently in Chicago, uh, yeah, Chicago summer. So thanks for being up there in Illinois, hanging out with me. All right. So Summer's question, I'm going to read parts of her email for you all. And she says, my question is a bit complicated, or at least it is in my head. That's usually how it goes, right? (laughs) It's not really that hard, but in our head, it seems very hard. I definitely prefer the child-centered model, but one day a week, I go to a local elementary school, and the office that I'm in changes from time to time and has board games in them. In another training that I completed, I was told that board games should not be in a child-centered playroom. Absolutely not true. The board games can likely not be taken out of the room as they're not my belongings and the school is short on space. How should I approach this with the clients? I've tried both ways and I'm still not sure what works best. With one client, I put a limit about not touching the other person's things, but then for another client, I just let them do whatever they wanted with them. Thanks so much. All right, Summer. So thanks for this. Let's let's dive in because I do get a lot of questions, not only in the coaching program, but even in the collective, we've talked about this a little bit. So let me begin with the declaration that you absolutely can have games in a child-centered playroom. And I'm not sure what the context was in which you were told that board games should not be in a child-centered playroom, but that is not the child-centered approach. Games are very therapeutically valuable and games serve a purpose. Games are in many, many child-centered playrooms, but there are some considerations about making it effective. So let's talk through those. You do want to be intentional about the type of games that you have. So obviously some are in your case, they're not your games and you're sharing an office. So not that you can necessarily dictate what games are in there, but for everyone listening, it is important to realize that the games should be therapeutically intentional. And there are certain games that are very well suited for a child-centered playroom. This is not an exhaustive list, but I'm just going to share the ones that I have and that many child-centered play therapists keep as a general rule. So Risk, very popular child-centered game. Don't Break the Ice, Uno Cards, Shoots and Ladders, also known as Snakes and Ladders in other countries, especially Australia. Connect Four is a very popular one. Guess Who, very helpful. Candyland, any type of jigsaw puzzles, regular cards, so a, a traditional deck of cards. 
and then also card games. So we often will have Old Maid, we often will have Go Fish, those types of card games similar to Uno where it is cards, but they serve a certain purpose. So not an exhaustive list, but those are the types of games that I and many other child-centered play therapists have in their playrooms. So the games can absolutely be included in a child-centered playroom, and you have to understand the purpose that they serve and how it will unfold with kids as they are part are involved in the child-centered play therapy process. So as a general rule, if kids gravitate toward games at the beginning of therapy, so early on in their therapeutic process, if they go toward games, we almost always can recognize they either have a high anxiety level or they are craving safe play that is structured and controlled and it feels easy for them to play that kind of game while they're warming up, while they're in the initiation stage, stage, while they're building a relationship with you. They're not quite ready to dive into their stuff yet. How do they handle that fear and overwhelm and worry and, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what to play with. I don't want to play. I don't know where my play might take me. I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to dive into this deep junk yet. So they will naturally move toward games and structured type of play like that. And it's because it's controllable. Now, that's not inherently a problem. The child-centered way, the non-directive way, says that kids know what they need. So if early on in the process they need structure and control, and that makes them feel safe and at ease and comfortable, then games provide that for them. So early on in the process, we can recognize that there's almost always that kind of inclination for highly anxious kids or kids that are not ready, willing, or able to dive into their deeper stuff yet. However, toward the end of treatment, kids will also often gra- uh, gravitate, I just about said graduate, but that was not what I wanted to say, gravitate toward that type of game, structure, controlled, calm type of play. But that means something completely different at the end of the process. When we see children move toward playing games and they're ready to wrap up, that is the indication that they are no longer feeling pressed to address whatever issues they were working on before. They don't have a need for any new theme to emerge. And they are very comfortable with you at that point. So a collaborative engagement is something that they want. So they'll often come in and say, you want to play a game? And it's just a calm, stable, centered activity that they are willing and able to do. Because remember, their external play is reflective of their internal state. So if they are internally calm and stable and centered, they can come in and play in that way. So playing a game where it's just for fun, that's very important at the end of therapy because it's reflective that they're not working on any big things anymore in the playroom. So we see game gravitation for different reasons at different points, but in both of those scenarios, it's still very appropriate in a child-centered playroom. Now, other questions that emerge when you do have games in your playroom, which you should, by the way, I don't want that to seem like it's a choice. You should have games in your playroom. So when you have that type of game play, other things end up emerging. So what do you do when a child cheats? What do you do when a child makes up their own rules? What do you do when the game is never played fairly? And you lose ad nauseum every single time. What do you do when the child is grasping at power and control through gameplay? So they are putting themselves in positions of advantage and authority and knowledge and all of these benefits of being able to orchestrate the entire game and how it's played and what the rules are. And of course the rules change and the rules are different for you than they are for the kid. And then the kid blatantly cheats and then they say, ha, I win. And you were all the way down on number two. And I'm specifically talking about candy, uh, sorry, shoots and ladders because it's hilarious how we were just talking about that on the collective call last week too. When you get a kid that's like, 
oh, I get to go up the snakes too, or I get to go up the slides too. And, you know, but you only have to go down the slides and whatever. So you watch that power dynamic, you watch the cheating, you watch the need to be in control, you watch them need to win and need to set them up for success. And over time, that shifts because the pendulum was too far swung to one side. And then over time, the child starts to usually, you also get to cheat. <laughs> That's usually the first step. So the child's cheating, but then you get to cheat too. And then all of a sudden, you know, you both win. And then all of a sudden, you know, you actually get to have the same benefits that the child does. And then eventually you're playing in a truly fair capacity and you might actually win and the child's okay with it. Look at the therapeutic value of having those board games in your room because the child was able to work through all of that stuff while playing a board game with you which is why board games are so helpful and which is why they are appropriate for a child-centered playroom. So I hope that y'all find that helpful. If you have hesitated having games in your room, you should absolutely have them. And games are so stinking expensive. Oh my gosh, we love games. Even as a family, we have a ton. But I kind of refuse to buy games unless they're really on sale because they've just gotten so crazy expensive. So my encouragement to you is go to thrift stores, Thrift stores have bazillions of games. You do want to check and make sure the pieces are there and stuff like that. You need to open it up and assess the contents. However, you can get great games very cheap at thrift stores. And I would recommend doing that because if you want to supplement with games in your playroom, you know, you could spend a hundred bucks on like four games and that's just not effective use of funds, in my opinion. I'm, I'm pretty frugal. So go to thrift stores and get them used. And as long as all the pieces are there, you know, the, look, the boxes are going to get stepped on, the corners are going to get ripped open, you know, the, the boards are going to, the stickers are going to start to get peeled off of them. I, kids are hard on games anyway. So don't spend money on brand new stuff that's just going to get messed up. My unsolicited two cents. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so Summer, thank you so much for the question. I appreciate that. And for those of you that have not checked out the collective yet, I would love to have you on there. We have two collective calls each week, ccptcollective.com. And you get to have Q&A with me twice a week. So if you would like to interact and hang out with other CCPTs, last week our calls were hilarious, y'all. Oh my gosh, we were laughing and people were trying to whistle and oh, oh my word, we had such a good time. So if you want to check that out, I'd love to have you on there, ccptcollective.com. If you want me to answer a question on the podcast, you can always email me at brenna at thekidcounselor.com. Hope you have a lovely first week of April. I'm super grateful for each and every one of you. Love y'all. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.